so Daniel, you have a new book out, which our students have been assigned a couple of chapters, and I hope other people will buy this. The title's on the slide that we're they're showing right now. Um, Dan, do you mind uh, giving maybe a little bit of a self-introduction and then also telling us something briefly about your book before you go into your lecture? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for that opportunity and thanks for that introduction. Um, it's very much a pleasure to be back in conversation with people at Temple. I remember those early conversations on pop culture at Temple. There was more than one of them, I think, and more than one of them was indeed in conversation with, in conversation with, uh, with David Leheny, to whom I give a lot of credit for this book and this work in general. Um, so it's wonderful to be back in conversation with you all, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, a uh, cultural anthropologist trained in the North American tradition. Um, I've been associated with the University of Cambridge for several years, and this book is sort of a long belated uh, book, um, which comes out of my, my first main PhD research that I did in, in Japan in sort of the late uh, 2000s, early 2010, 2011. Um, so it's a bit of a turn from a little bit from ethnograph ethnography into sort of recent history. Um, and I'll be excited to sort of dive into the book a little bit uh, more as we begin the formal talk. Terrific. Um, well, um, I know you've been traveling. You've been in Arizona, Cambridge, maybe going to Hawaii as well. Uh, currently in Hawaii, yeah, finishing up a bit of, of new field work. So yeah, since I, I left Japan in 2017, uh, so I was teaching at University of uh, Jose University for a number of years, left uh, Japan for a big research project in the European Union on actually a current research that I'm writing a new book on, which is about uh, affective technology. So technologies which presume to read human emotion and which are embedded in things like social emotional robots. So I've been doing that project for the last several years, and that project actually picks up on themes that I sort of left untied in this book about affect and politics and how new media technologies um, sort of mediate uh, the ground between how we personally feel and how political administrations uh, sort of hope that publics feel in a certain way. Well, if, if you want to continue, I'm, I'm not going to interview you per se, although we can get to that in the Q&A if you'd like to tell us more about your, your book. So, so sure. Um, yeah, I thought what I'd try to do today is just give kind of a, a general outline of what the book tries to do. And I thought by doing that and by sharing a few examples uh, from the book, I might give sort of um, sort of a nice, a nice preview of the book in general, but also uh, try to describe some of the the themes that I'm really interested in as a cultural anthropologist between politics and emotion. That's really kind of my, my deep interest that I've had for yeah. several years. Um, and in particular, I'm, I'm kind of very interested in the different ways that human emotion can be constructed, influenced, and sometimes transformed by political processes. That's really where my, the heart of my interest lies. Um, so today's talk, I thought I would, you know, more or less introduce the book um, which is titled here, Administering Affect. Um, and it tries to show how the way Japanese state officials have tried to manage the feelings of foreign publics through the administration of the nation's popular culture um, and how in doing so, this has also sort of influenced the way people in Japan feel about their own national culture uh, and as a consequence, their own identity in relation to it. So to start us off, I thought it might be helpful to start with just a description of what I mean by this phrase pop culture Japan, which is really kind of the center of this book. Um, and then I'll try to give some examples of it in order to demonstrate how a kind of national government attitude toward policies of culture in Japan can have, um, and in fact did have from my perspective, unanticipated effects for how people feel about their national culture at home. So one way to describe pop culture Japan is to kind of contrast it with the term popular culture in general. So popular culture, especially in Japan over the last three decades that this book concentrates on, I think it's fair to say includes a very broad, diverse, almost a kind of wild variety of commodities, 
practices, styles, ideas, ethics, and desires expressed through various popular forms of media. And that's why I put this, this background slide on there, which is also from the cover of the book. Um, a really nice image showing the sort of cornucopia of what popular culture in Japan is, this wild mix of things um, that creators create and invest in for different reasons. Um, it's diverse, it's varied, and it can be very critical uh, as well. Uh, very deep, very insightful, very self-reflexive. Uh, pop culture Japan, on the other hand, and here's my contrast, is really a different figure altogether. For me, it's this version of Japan as national culture that is imagined primarily by Japan's mostly male politicians and bureaucrats and a number of government advisors and some content creators and pop culture fans. And this version of Japan is less an open, very much less a kind of political and playful figure. Rather, it's fundamentally a political figure, uh, which for me in the imaginary of those government figures managing the image of Japan's national culture portrays Japan as a popular culture and content commodity powerhouse uh, that is admired for its creative culture. But critically, in the eyes of administrators, pop culture Japan is also imagined as made up of, of national culture in which the appeal abroad for Japan's popular culture translates into affection and thus political power for Japan as a nation state. And so this is the meaning of the term soft power that I'm sure many of the students here have heard many times before. Um, it's a phrase that is often talked about in Japan studies and in popular Japan studies in particular. Um, but I want to take a particularly anthropological lens on it. Um, and from that point of view, soft power is really a way of looking at the world that links popular culture and political culture. So uh, to give a very brief definition for those who, who haven't heard the term or who might um, appreciate a sort of refreshing, uh, soft power was this term coined by Harvard political scientist Joseph Nye in the early 1990s used to describe the proposition that nation states might achieve political power, prestige, influence over other nation states, not through tra traditional hard power strategies of military might or economic strength, but rather through a nation's or its culture's attractiveness, um, which was grounded in three basic areas for Nye, a nation's culture, its values, and its policies. So this idea became very popular in Japan, especially in the early 2000s, uh, for important reasons I'll touch on shortly. But for now, I'll just say that this attractive idea by you know, this North American Harvard political scientist seemed like a great way for Japan's state administrators at the time to connect the perceived popularity of Japanese pop culture abroad to political ambitions at home to grow Japan's geopolitical power. So pop culture, Japan, in my formal definition of it, um, is a kind of collection of pop culture diplomacy projects, government-sponsored imagery, soft power ideology, nation branding strategies, and above all, what I'm trying to get at with this book is really this kind of emotional or affective concern among state administrators and bureaucrats over the international status of the nation that in the book I describe as, as kind of geopolitical anxiety, uh, which I think is largely responsible for helping fuel this very hopeful imagery um, around pop culture Japan that reinvents Japan from its image previously as this economic powerhouse in the 1970s and 80s into a cultural powerhouse since the 2000s. So uh, to really understand pop culture Japan as this kind of emergent but dominant figure around the world really, I think one has to pay attention to how feelings, affects, emotions, actually among the state administrators themselves get translated into national cultural policy. And that's the work uh, that the book sort of aims to do and that is captured in its title, Administering Affect. So for me, this idea of pop culture Japan helps us understand these, these questions quite well. Um, and particularly it helps us see a very precise affective or emotional mechanism that is at play here in government policy. So, you know, as, as scholars and as social scientists, and students of social science in particular, I don't think we always pay attention to the emotional dimensions of, of policy and policy administration. Um, but to me, this was a very critical element to understand changes in national Japanese culture over the last 20 years or so. So, 
formally, I write in the book that pop culture Japan is essentially an imaginary that is also a political tool by which anxious concerns about Japan's geopolitical status in the world can be translated into a hopefulness for Japan's future and a pride in what Japan can essentially become. So in this sense, pop culture Japan is a way of imagining the nation and thus those people that identify with it as a successful, appealing, creative cultural nation, or uh, to give uh, much credit where it is due, what David Leheny has also in his own perspective called quite eloquently uh, an empire of hope. So in this sense, pop culture Japan also very much entangles political con concerns of the state with personal concerns of identity and pride. And that's what I'm really interested in, that mix between the political and the personal there. So where does this anxiety that I'm talking about and trying to capture through fieldwork actually come from? Um, well, in the most general terms, this anxiety for me comes from a breakdown in a previously existing national imaginary that was tied to Japan's global economic success. So I'm sure many here are familiar with this very common story that we tell each other of Japan's national history, um, specifically that revolves around Japan's economic success in the 1980s and then its uh, dramatic growth of the economy compared with the impoverished state of Japan after the Pacific War or World War II. So this story of rapid economic growth, sometimes called the Japanese miracle, has become this kind of dominant national narrative for Japan that we often, you know, reproduce in Japan, in Japan studies that quite dramatically then broke down. The narrative broke down with the very, you know, material collapse of Japan's asset bubble and broader economy in the early 1990s. So pop culture Japan then describes how this new national imaginary emerged in Japan, largely through government efforts that served to translate this anxiety over Japan's loss of economic growth and all the social and psychological forms of security that were tied to that into a kind of new hope for Japan or what a new Japan uh, might look like in the eyes of particular uh, Japanese bureaucrats. Um, so let me go into some of the evidence and examples uh, of the book to try to demonstrate this point um, and try to draw out um, how this anxiety, I think, was actually very, very real, but became even more real as it was narrated through very public uh, figures and public channels. So there's really no better public channel than Japan's public broadcaster, NHK. You know, a public broadcaster is uh, basically has uh, the remit to sort of narrate the feelings of the nation, of the national body. Um, that's what they sort of get their funding for. And that's why they walk around from door to door knocking on your house for funding rather than just taxing you, right? They get a more direct sense of what the people are really feeling. So public broadcasters are a great place to go to for sort of evidence of what uh, its programmers think the nation is feeling at large. So in 2011, taking some obvious inspiration from a 2010 article in The Economist on Japan's Burden, um, NHK announced this set of programming called the Overcoming the Japan Syndrome campaign. Um, and they announced in this campaign that NHK is to start months of intensive coverage about Japan's national malaise rooted in years of economic and social stagnation, naming it the Japan Syndrome. They said the Jap um, that the campaign will be led by Next Japan, NHK's flagship, flagship project providing comprehensive reporting and analysis of long-term issues surrounding Japan. And then they went on to say that anxiety clouds over the society as Japan faces unprecedented demographic change and global competition. We will address the issue head on and search for a remedy to climb out of this situation. Okay, for me, a great example of, you know, public broadcasters sort of narrating the feeling of the nation or perhaps interjecting a feeling that officials feel more prominently than other people in Japan, precisely because they are, in their administrative function, obliged to take notice of and be concerned for the status of the nation. So they spend a lot of time imagining it, and then feelings of anxiety sort of come along with that practice of imagining. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that later in regards to other agencies of uh, the Japanese nation state. 
Now, as many of you here will know, um, in the 1990s, the anthropologist Marilyn Ivey produced what to my mind was one of the most sort of brilliant and rich ethnographic critiques of Japanese national culture as it existed in the 1980s and 90s that was very much grounded in sentiments of nostalgia. So she discussed things like Japan's national railway campaigns, festival culture, um, ethnographic writing, and a number of other rather divergent practices in which uh, a kind of single cultural logic could be found. And that cultural logic, according to Marilyn Ivey, was that essentially what was being reproduced in Japan was a sense of loss, a sense that what was truly Japanese was that which was lost in Japan's transition to modernity with the Meiji Restoration in 1868, and that which is now memorialized in cultures of nostalgia for Japan's traditional culture. So um, this, I think, was a very astute analysis. And in many regards, it holds true today, I think. Um, however, I think there's some important differences that I'm actually trying to point out with this book. So the nostalgia for what has been lost from traditional Japan, quote unquote, traditional Japan, is, again, no doubt a dominant narrative still in Japan today. But I think the figure of pop culture Japan makes a bit of a break with nostalgia purposefully on the part of, of, of bureaucrats and cultural administrators. And it turns that past-oriented sense of nostalgic loss and quite deliberately tries to, from the point of view of bureaucrats and, and cultural administrators, turns that nostalgic loss into a hope for what is to come, essentially a, a kind of very new Japan grounded in its innovative and creative popular culture and popular culture industries. Now, it's also important for me here to state up front that this figure of pop culture Japan is also fundamentally a political figure, which is to say that it is a contested figure. Not everyone agrees on what um, uh, or on to what degree Japan should be represented via its popular culture. So people disagree on this. And it's also this contested politics of what Japan should be presented to the world as that I'm also trying to trace ethnographically in the book. So um, for example, just to give a sort of quick summary or breakdown of this sort of contested politics of pop culture Japan, while most of pop culture Japan's advocates, that is the bureaucrats, um, cultural administrators, um, are often disproportionately older, often male, the representative images of pop culture Japan, um, as I'll discuss a bit later, are more often young and female. Um, and this very clearly for me inscribes a politics of gender into a national story about what Japan as a national culture is. So there are a number of examples I use in the book to try and show this contested nature of pop culture Japan. But one that sticks out to me most um, just to give a sort of quick ethnographic story, is of one female cultural policy researcher whom I encountered in field work. Um, and this was after meeting several rather committed male uh, soft power advocates in various government offices who were promoting the possibilities of Japan's pop culture uh, national future, so to speak. So when I asked her about her own impression of these programs, uh, she kind of laughed and explained that for her, these programs were just places uh, essentially for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to deposit portions of its budget that it did not want to lose. So she basically kind of laughed at these programs and explained that she often had no idea what these bureaucrats were, were really thinking. So um, in short, what I wanna bring out with that quick example, and then I'll go on to some more, is that there's really a kind of push and pull dynamic in these programs. Um, surrounding pop culture Japan and cool Japan, which I'll get onto in a second. So to the degree that a central government pushes one narrow image of the nation, of the national culture in Japan, especially one dominated by male administrators and young female imagery, it is then likely to marginalize or alienate a number of people who do not see themselves in those images of the nation. So as I go through the book, I try to describe both the dominant male administrative sentiments driving the figure of pop culture Japan and the people 
this image of Japan sort of rubs the wrong way or for whom this image feels uncomfortable. So let me try and give you a couple other examples of this. Um, a good place to start in doing so is to discuss some of the variety of policies that many of you have heard before uh, called Cool Japan and the Cool Japan campaign, which despite its programs going on now for almost 20 years, and despite ample criticism of it and many projections that Cool Japan has died, uh, actually never seems to really go away. This idea of Cool Japan is very hard to actually kill off, which I find very interesting. So Cool Japan is the name of a, uh, just to give some historical context here, a deliberate government campaign, primarily engineered by the public diplomacy department of Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but with help from other agencies to explicitly connect the cultural appeal of certain popular commodities in Japan, like anime, manga, fashion, and pop culture, to the appeal of Japanese culture at large. So in this way, Japan's state administrators reason that soft power can be practically built and managed to a certain degree by labeling as many aspects of Japanese popular culture cool as possible. So this idea of, of nation branding uh, has been most explicitly discussed by the academic and policy advisor, Simon Anholt. And it's been taken up by really many countries around the world over the past two decades, in particular as a strategy of governance in a period of perceived increased global competition, and primarily economic competition, where state administrators, you know, in Japan and outside Japan, globally now, feel like they must try to manage the image of the nation because the consequence of not doing so uh, are so dire for global competition, essentially. So where did cool Japan really come from? Um, as other scholars uh, have noted and written about this extensively, uh, people like Kuki Chu, David Lahani, Yasushi Watanabe, Nisi Mutmanskin, many others, this idea for Cool Japan was borrowed directly from the Cool Britannia campaign in the 1990s Britain. Um, it was also sort of uh, um, emerged out of pressure um, that South Korea in particular was putting uh, in terms of the investments uh, Korea was putting into its own national popular culture. Um, and both of these influences are quite readily admitted by administrators that I spoke with. Now, the problem with nation branding is that it doesn't really work, uh, or it doesn't work without also usually causing a lot of backlash, which uh, again speaks to the very contested politics of anxiety surrounding pop culture in Japan. So when governments try to control the meaning and imagery around the various cultures within their borders, it can easily come across as propaganda and then be rejected by, um, by people uh, who associate with that nation. Um, and this backlash can be seen in efforts to efforts by different agencies in Japanese government to brand uh, aspects of Japanese culture as quote unquote cool to such a degree that it kind of becomes a sort of parody. And this is what has happened to cool Japan. It's sort of become a parody of itself. Um, and I can give one kind of nice example of this, which comes from the TV show Cool Japan, some of you might know, which was aired on NHK, again, Japan's public broadcaster for several years starting in 2008. So the way the show is organized is that Japanese commentators invite some foreign guests. Um, usually they're like study abroad students who speak some Japanese and they're invited on the show to discuss an aspect of Japanese culture that the foreigners find quote unquote cool. Now, although this theme is really organized in most cases by show uh, producers, um, it's presented as if it's coming from these sort of foreign students and foreign visitors to Japan. Now, um, this organization of the show works quite well for a, a few initial episodes, which focus on pop music, fashion, anime, all those typical things we think of as cool Japanese pop culture. But then as the show continues over the years and new commodities are sought to then subsequently brand as cool, the task gets a little bit more difficult and then more and more resembles a kind of parody. Um, so to give you an example of this, I collected uh, a list of all the sort of, uh, or a lot of the cool Japan uh, show themes over the years. 
And if you just put them side by side, it starts to look a little, uh, a little like the kind of parody I'm, I'm discussing here. So here's some examples of what has been branded by the show Cool Japan as, in fact, Cool Japan. Uh, stationary, shopping, uh, winter, examinations, childbirth, child rearing, memorial services, uh, Japanese men, Japanese women, mothers, fathers, anniversary parties, sweets, discipline, hot pots, sightseeing, toys, health, luck, konkatsu, uh, that is activities uh, to help singles seeking uh, marriage partners, lights, rain or the rainy season, tsu, uh, privacy, the Japanese language, Japanese companies in parts one and two, prayers, gifts, tears, containers, soy sauce, shame, sleeping, and disaster prevention. So uh, that gives you just one example of one of the programs and policy strategy, strategies by which uh, certain cultural administrators, sometimes tied to the government, sometimes aligned with the government, sometimes um, uh, just uh, working in parallel to it, explicitly try to sort of alter the national image of Japan's culture in order to bring about specific feelings among foreign publics for Japan, that is admiration, that also then evokes certain feelings at home among Japanese people, maybe of pride, maybe of discomfort um, in domestic publics, basically. And um, I give a few examples of these uh, various feelings that publics have in uh, response to shows like Cool Japan later in the book. Um, so another example I take from the book um, to demonstrate some of these pop culture Japan programs and ideologies is of anime diplomacy. Um, so one example of a soft power program I, I really like as an example uh, comes from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whose officials in March 2008 performed the official nomination of Doraemon, who is an animated robot cat from the future uh, in the animation world, anime manga world, to the post of anime ambassador. So in this act, the state is sort of performing a kind of um, uh, what I describe in the book as characterization of national Japanese culture. And I'm borrowing that phrase characterization um, from the anthropologist Shusuke Nozawa. And by performing this kind of characterization or maybe even a caricaturization of the state, in this process, Officials also kind of characterize or caricaturize the role of the bureaucrat itself into something that is sort of a promoter of Japan's pop culture. So what I'm trying to demonstrate in my discussion of the anime ambassador and of the bureaucrats that manage programs like the anime ambassador is that the state as we imagine it is by no means a kind of single thing. Uh, nor are the feelings that administrators feel toward it, uh, let alone the many members of Japan's diverse publics. Um, that is, different government agencies and their officials are um, what I think kind of administrative, administratively obliged, we might say, to feel responsible for the image of Japan as that image is constructed through a particular Japanese government agency and then care for it accordingly. Um, so let me just give you one example of this. And again, the reason I'm doing this is to suggest that not everyone feels about pop culture Japan or feels about Japan national culture the same way by any means. Different government agencies um, are sort of obliged to feel in different ways about the state depending on the remit of their agency. So for example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Japan Foundation have rather different attitudes uh, toward programs like the selection of anime ambassadors like the robot cat Doraemon. Um, so just like officials select characters like Doraemon to represent and depict Japan's national culture, in doing so, again, officials I'm suggesting themselves in their respective administrations are kind of then characterizing themselves in a way. Okay, so from that point of view, a sort of characterized Ministry of Foreign Affairs official is someone who is primarily concerned with the ability for a program, a program in their agency to generate positive appeal for the nation state. So this official's obligation is grounded in a government ministry that is faced with essentially the hard facts of global security. That's what the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, is uh, organized to concern itself with. So anime diplomacy 
from that point of view is seen as a resource of soft power that can be leveraged through publicity, measured both in the quantity of images circulated um, by the agency and those working with it in the perception um, and in the perception of the effective qualities those images elicit and represent in members of the public. So this makes it seem quite natural then to Ministry of Foreign Affairs officials to think of programs like anime or cute ambassadors as similar to a program in like the self-defense forces training in Iraq, for example. Um, so both of those kind of policies are both practices of national security that will build Japanese prestige and political power. So in this way, an official in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is kind of serving one's office and at the same time serves the office's demands of national security. And this is what I think is sort of obligatory about it. And that's why I use this term uh, obligatory nationalism to describe it a bit um, in, in this part of the book that where I'm talking about anime diplomacy. Um, and I think one can look at some, some really nice visual images to get an example of what I mean here, uh, which I also include in the book. So one of these um, <clears throat> is of the anime character, Captain Tsubasa, uh, adorning Japan's self-defense forces water trucks during aid operations in Iraq. Um, another dominant image would be of the now late Prime Minister Abe Shinzo dressed up as Super Mario in the closing ceremonies to the Olympics in Rio in 2016. So here we see Japanese officials literally using the pop culture framework of characters um, to actually characterize themselves, again, borrowing this term from Shinsuke Nozawa, in a way that displays to the world an image of what I'm calling pop culture Japan, uh, an image of a nation whose essence is then increasingly publicly defined by its popular culture. Okay, so uh, just one more, a final example I'd like to take up um, and one that drives more directly at kind of the gendered aspects of pop culture Japan. And that's essentially of the cute uh, ambassadors. So the cute ambassadors, uh, many of you might be familiar with, but if you're not, are three young women who were selected to represent different fashion trends popular in Japan in the early 2000s to 2010s. And they were selected by Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to represent Japan at overseas cultural fairs and exhibits. Um, their official title um, was called the New Trend Communicators of Japanese Pop Culture or Popokarucha Hashinchi Fashion Bunya. Uh, and they were commonly referred to as the Ambassadors of Cute or Kawaii Taishi. Now their mission as described by officials in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was to transmit these new trends of Japanese pop culture in the field of fashion to the rest of the world and to promote understanding of Japan in the process. So uh, to just run through them very quickly, um, the ambassador Kimura Yu at the bottom of your screen, for example, she represents the Harajuku style fashion or Harajuku K fashion, uh, named after this popular shopping area um, in uh, or near Shibuya. Aoki Misako represents uh, Lolita fashion, uh, drawing its name obviously from Vladimir Nabokov's famous 1955 novel by that same name. Um, and then the third ambassador is the actor and fashion coordinator uh, Fujioka Shizuka, who represents high school girls fashion or Joshi Kosei fashion, uh, which is kind of characterized by these plaid skirts, blazers, white blouses, and, and scarves. Um, similar to the kind of mandatory uh, uniforms worn by girls at most of Japan's secondary schools. Now, what is very interesting to me about the way the ambassadors were announced in February 2009 by representatives in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was that immediately following their introduction, there was a second announcement about Japan's peace and security building conflicts in Africa. Uh, namely in Sudan. So essentially the cute ambassadors were introduced and then right after that, there's another announcement about Japan's peacekeeping efforts in the Sudan, which for me as a sort of sequence of events performed at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs 
um, really clearly places these three young Japanese women in the context of serving as resources and strategies for procuring Japanese security in terms of soft power that can be exercised within the nation's self-defense forces or with its popular culture. So culture that is seen um, originally as a sort of consumer or artistic practice then becomes very clearly a kind of political resource through events like this. And this kind of official uh, government performance illustrates quite clearly for me how security in Japan, you could say, is imagined through a very gendered lens um, and imagined and managed primarily through older male bureaucrats in Japan. So, you know, for many critics of this uh, program of the Kawaii Taishi, uh, such as the anthropologist Laura Miller, for example, this um, practice indeed represents, or this way of representing young women in Japan represents a very narrow male-centric perspective on what is otherwise a very rich and diverse, uh, quote unquote, girl culture in Japan. So just like popular culture in Japan is very rich and diverse, so is Japan's girl culture. Um, the aesthetics and practices of young women, basically. But just like pop culture, Japan is a more narrow and male-centric political imaginary, so too are the ambassadors of cute. Um, so as Laura Miller has commented, they are depicted in various government programs in a very narrow, flattened out kind of bandwidth of this broader culture. Now, one can see this quite clearly in presentations of the ambassadors at overseas events, um, such as the Japan pop culture exhibit, which regularly takes place in Paris. And this is uh, not an image directly from that event, but it's sort of cast in similar ways and so I thought it would be um, a good image to show here um, in lieu of not having any of the original photos. Um, so in 2009, Kimura Yu um, appeared on stage uh, in Paris as Japan's cute ambassador. Um, but even though she sort of featured on stage through the performance and through the presentation of her there and at other events, you can arguably see quite a sort of heavy-handed kind of male control of the presentation in this instance. So um, introducing Kimura is a male government advisor, um, essentially taking the lead in presenting Kimura um, and then engaging with the audience on her behalf. So for example, asking the audience if she thinks she is cute, like Minasama, kawaii to um, and that, and um, you know, asking, uh, asking if, if they think she's cute, inviting them to take pictures afterwards. Uh, it's really sort of the, the sort of male uh, official who is mediating the program. Now, this might be seen as just sort of one dimension of typical kawaii or cute culture in Japan, where the kawaii aesthetic is seen as kind of demure, um, although it's often you know, not depicted as demure in Japan. Um, but it can also quite easily be read as a kind of sort of managed performance of a new national culture by mainly male bureaucrats for the purpose of this soft power cultivation. And indeed, many of these um, government advisors were, were very much thinking deliberately through this lens. Okay, um, so I think from the perspective of, of recent Japanese history, um, this, this cute ambassador program is actually very difficult to imagine outside this global geopolitical discourse of soft power nation branding, which emerged over the last two decades. So I think they go hand in hand here and it's important to sort of make that connection. And for me, it's also quite um, clearly that these cute ambassador programs represent a program whose content, because it is rather playful and ambiguous and hard to tie to the measurement of soft power effects, is quite clearly grounded in these ambiguous feelings of anxiety keenly felt by Japan's mostly male administrators over Japan's declining geopolitical status in the world and in particular in East Asia. And that's really what I'm trying to draw out in the field work I did and with these examples. And in general, the argument I'm trying to make in the book um, at large. Now, 
it's important to note, I think, that you know, there are quite a few criticisms, direct criticisms of programs like this uh, coming from both in and outside Japan. And there are plenty of people in Japan for whom this representation of Japan, primarily through young, cute women in popular kawaii fashion, feels quite deliberately uncomfortable um, and lacks, from their perspective, the depth of Japan's culture to the extent that images like these are disproportionately presented as what is quintessential and significant about culture in Japan. And this is where you can see how culture for the government becomes a deliberate strategic tool, uh, one of geopolitical governance and the effort to manage global publicity. Um, so let me give you one example of this, which is a quote um, from a Ministry of Foreign Affairs bureaucrat who will definitely remain unnamed, who said, um, there are a number of criticisms, of course. I received a question from a woman member of the parliament whom I've known for a very long time. And she herself is a very attractive lady, he says in conversation. And she said there may be some misunderstanding in the recipient country if a young girl walks around with a very short miniskirt. Um, and I'm going on with the quote here. But first of all, it is only one girl who shows her legs and the official sort of laughing at, at, at this point in the conversation. And to go on, quote, but my response was very formal, and I thought it was appropriate to answer in order for the culture or art of soft power. When we send or deliver this soft power culture, the most important thing is that it is well received by the recipient country. So, end quote there. So, in this example, one can see how the emphasis on soft power um, and for soft power officials, I should say, is is on publicity really first and foremost, and sometimes at the expense, uh, at the extent of the content and meaning of these programs. Whereas for you know officials not in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, like the Japan Foundation, for example, um, they would have much more of a problem of a program just being only about publicity. Um, and this is how you see you know differences in how different government agencies uh, contest and deliberate on really um, the meaning of these images of. of uh, of national culture. Um, so there are a lot of other famous examples of people criticizing this image of pop culture Japan and cool Japan deliberately. Um, so for example, the, the famous artist Murakami Takashi um, and the lead singer Gakuto or Gakuto Oshiro have, have both called soft power and cool Japan programming rather limited and even stupid. Uh, so um, Murakami Takashi uh, called Cool Japan stupid, too stupid to even discuss. Uh, and then Gact is cited as saying that the Japanese government uh, made a new attempt at this promoting Japan's creative industries, that is, in the name of Cool Japan, but while they have set up a huge budget for it, uh, which in fact they did um, beginning in 2013, they have no idea where that money should go. Um, so to try to sort of wrap up here and give a, a basic overview of what the book is aiming at and what our discussion today is aiming at, um, which is also sort of summarized more concisely in the last chapter of the book. Um, you know, one way this book functions or to think about it um, is that it's sort of trying to document through a lot of different cases, a similar emotional mechanism that I felt was um, observably fueling policy around pop culture Japan, but doing so sort of behind the scenes and not specifically in the cultural policy itself. And it's a very dynamic process here. And it's essentially that you have this imagery of pop culture Japan transforming a geopolitical anxiety over Japan, slipping prestige into hope for its regeneration through popular culture and soft power. And so I try to describe this process through a kind of map that starts at the center of this process and then goes outwards. So the early chapters document administrators who are fully invested in this process. Um, then the latter chapters of the book move into terrain where people are kind of more alienated from this process. Um, people for whom pop culture Japan feels almost marginalizing and alienating to them. Um, and my ultimate example of that is actually the literature of, of Murakami Haruki, which I discussed in the final chapter, which I won't go into today, but I'll just sort of 
I've referenced that um, if you're curious. Um, and Murakami Haruki, you know, in, in some ways is very quintessentially Japanese pop culture, and then in many other ways is, is really highly critical of anything sort of mainstream Japan at all. And so I end with a discussion of his literature in the book and with examples of people feeling alienated by images of pop culture Japan, because I think there's a kind of lesson in here um, and in Japan for all of us, for people outside Japan as well. And really particularly for everyone who, you know, feels the imposition of a nation state and must reconcile their personal identities with the national identities that are imposed on them. You know, this is a long, a long issue of identity in, in social science. And this lesson is essentially for me that although national administrations and national ideologies very often urge its citizens and urge us, I think we can say, to feel in ways that are symmetric with the state's interests, there are also ways of, as I say in the book, feeling otherwise, um, or feeling better, or feeling even ethnographically better, so to speak, when the nation's interests feel uncomfortable or feel wrong. And I think it's also something that anthropology as a discipline, as the discipline that I'm coming from, and then ethnography as a method of it, uh, can do quite well. Um, that is, bring out that, that sort of uh, friction between the sort of state's interests and, and personal inclinations to feel with or against it. And so that's what I've tried to communicate in this book, that relation between the political and the personal. And I hope it might resonate uh, with some of you if you get a chance to read it. Uh, on that level. And so with that, I'd, I'd love to hear if you have any uh, questions or points of discussion, and I'll throw it back to you, Kyle. Great. Thank you so much. Very interesting, Dan. Um, I'll take the opportunity of having the bullet pulpit here to ask a question or two, and then give students a chance to ask questions. I'll, I'll pass this microphone around if you want to raise your hand. Um, so Dan, I first really was exposed to this approach at that conference on the politics of popular culture that you participated in. David Lahaney was the keynote speaker. And one thing that struck me about that lecture that he gave is that he approached this kind of from the outside looking in as a political scientist. And one thing that I found over the years, I'll be interested if these students have the same feeling is that, you know, a lot of times a person's first point of entree, particularly for young people is as a consumer but not at this analytical remove or distance. And I, I remember having the feeling when David Lahaney talked that he was being, it was critical thinking, he wasn't being negative, but he was analyzing it in terms and ways in which the cool Japan discourse does not describe itself. And also maybe not the way in which consumers engage with it. So, He's a political scientist, you're more of a sociologist and anthropologist, but is this um, perspective on popular culture? There's, you've cited a number of people. Is there a literature and discourse on this? And could you specify those scholars who you think are doing some of the most interesting work on this? Uh, thanks for that, Kyle. There's a very long list of, of people who have been writing about soft power for a very long time. Uh, in Japan, um, and um, and some of them have have taken more of an ethnographic approach. Some have taken less. For the main part, the reason I went into this field kind of a long time ago now, went into this topic, is because most of the literature I saw was originated from the sort of political science perspective, um, or if it was more of a social scientific, sociological approach, or even anthropological, it was addressing um, policy. So it's the sort of like how to get at what's going on in Japan culturally through policy and analysis. So let's look at policies of cool Japan and see if we can read into them um, what bureaucrats are thinking. Um, and so, you know, uh, Nisimo Tomazgin, David Laheni, Yasushi Watanabe, Kuki Chu, um, um, there's a, hand, a handful of people who have, who have written on this um, and who my own work to whom my own work is indebted. 
what I tried to add to um, their conversations and what they had already contributed was really pr the perspective of Japanese bureaucrats themselves. Um, and not only their perspectives as communicated in their own words, and I've definitely tried to portray their own words in the book, um, but also some of the sentiments, feelings, emotions, which are underlying those discourses. So both of those things. And a lot of, I, sh I should say, a lot of the examples I, I gave here were kind of some of the more evocative examples, um, some of the more kind of uh, maybe fun examples for the sake, especially for the sake of, of sort of, um, of students. Um, and not all the examples are, are like that. There's, there's plenty of examples, specifically when I talk about Japan Foundation officials, where um, I think they come off as incredibly sort of, 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 sort of sympathetic uh, and nuanced um, and tries to show the very difficult task of a Japanese bureaucrat who is obliged to care for the nation and the nation's image abroad. I mean, all, Jap all governments have this, these sort of agencies that are responsible to sort of to the degree that they can cultivate a positive image for the nation. Some do it, you know, to more or less degrees. Um, but for the people who have that incredibly difficult task, how do they feel about that task and how do they do it? Um, so that's what I was trying to capture with some ethnographic examples and, and some of those examples I tried to share today. Great. So we have a student from our classroom here. This is a course called Ideology and Social Change in Japan. We have about 35 students here. And one of them would like to ask a question. Hello, um, my name is Lydia Wharton. And um, I was just wondering, I understand you were talking about like how a lot of the people who are in charge of, you know, showing the world that, that Japan is so cool and all, and they're often uh, older males, but the people who are representing Japan are young females. And I, I was just interested in understanding your your take on how that relates to like, the gender inequality in Japan and how Japan is um, like a bit of a, a more of a sexist country than like Western countries. Um, just kind of like that relationship between men and women in Japan and how like women are supposed to be kind of like held to this standard that they're supposed to represent like their family or their child to society. Yeah, thank you, Lydia. Um... So for all these questions, I'm, I'm definitely going to try to give, you know, a very anthropological perspective, um, something that's sort of based in my ethnography. And from that perspective, just to sort of uh, to say again what that means for me um, is to try to look at sort of something like you've mentioned, gender dynamics, um, sort of from the point of view of what's happening uh, recently historically and then what's happening on the ground like how are people literally engaging with perceptions of gender inequality how do they talk about it um, because from a political science point of view you can definitely um, or from an international relations point of view as well you can definitely sort of um, make these sort of standardized metrics for where gender should be in a nation um, and measure that across nations and that's you know often what political scientists do to some degree, obviously not only what they do, but it's, it's one thing, it's one way to approach gender. Um, what an anthropological perspective kind of adds to that is a little bit more nuanced in what's happening on the ground. So if I could just provide a little bit of that, and really I'll be referencing others' works who do this much better than me. So I would draw on, for example, um, Gabby Lukacs' work. Um, so she's written a lot about um, um, a female labor in Japan, um, in particular precarious labor, and in even more particular um, digital labor. So a very important point that she um, uh, notes is in, in a number of her works is that the Japanese economy went through transformations in the 1990s, went through a liberalization process. Um, so a process by which you know, many people were in full-time employment and those people were moving because of liberalization policies into more flexible employment, not as secure employment. And most of those people um, who were first affected by those policy changes 
and structural reforms were women because women um, were often seen as um, um, not as, as permanent workers. Um, they have responsibilities in the home. If they have children, they're presumed to leave the office before men. And so they would be the first to be um, essentially demoted in these structural reforms. So what's very important for Gabby Lukacs to note is that at the same time as these liberalization policies were happening, you also had a sort of digitalization uh, of many sectors of the economy and of labor, of communication, um, media technologies, and then um, along what comes with that is that the um, flexible labor that women, flexible positions of labor that people now find, women find them, now find themselves in, precarious forms of labor they find themselves in. What's open to them then are many of these sort of jobs of promoting themselves for entertainment um, through different uh, digitalized forms of media. Uh, and this could be like writing cell phone novels. It could be um, showing pictures of themselves online. It could be writing blogs. It could be doing vlogs. Um, and this is some of the, the examples that Gabby Lukacs takes up. So from that point of view, that's one way of many ways to look at um, gender inequality in Japan through a lens of structural economic transformation and how that is manifested, um, how people have to deal with that in terms of what's available to them, uh, in terms of what kind of the new digital economies are, are giving to them. Um, did that answer your question? She says yes. So we have three other students lined up and they'll ask questions in turn. Hello, um, I'm Cutting. Um, so my question is a little bit more domestic, but um, especially from like 2015 onwards, I noticed like there's a lot of um, cool Japan type of ad advertisement for um, the youth here, such as the self-defense force anime type um, um, ads on YouTube or um, Tokyo Metro with their um, SDG um, um, videos. Um, would you say that um, that came about from the re international aid re response or is it based on domestic, how it worked domestically, which they, which the government decide to put more internationally? Um, good question. Um, you know, if you're, if you're talking about the most recent campaigns, um, interestingly, you, you know, you might be a little bit more up to date on them than, than me. So the work that I discussed in the book is sort of bracketed um, from this period from the early 2000s to sort of late 2000 around 2010, 2011, and then kind of sort of ends, ends there. Um, so I, in fact, be very curious to, you know, to learn what's going on more, more recently. And, um, you know, this is sort of, you know, how, how scholarship works, you know, David Lahani offered his, a lot of his um, evaluations of, of kind of soft power policies um, happening in the early 2000s. And, um, uh, and then sort of left off a bit. And then so I took uh, up a little bit after that. And it's sort of, I feel like my turn to sort of pass it on to, to people like you to sort of analyze. What I will say is, you know, that example of the, um, you know, the Draymond as anime ambassador, I think what we, we see very well, and this is why the anthropologist Shunsuke Nozawa's article on characterization, which he um, wrote in 2013 in the journal Semiotics, which I highly recommend, is so valuable because it shows how much of a trope this idea of characterization, of turning into character, um, so many aspects of Japanese public culture um, can be or, or relies on. So this um, practice of using characters to communicate um, something from a uh, a public service uh, office or a commodity, or indeed now the self-defense forces is sort of uh, a, a common practice. And perhaps it was only inevitable that this would have been taken up by, by the self-defense forces more uh, explicitly. 
we have other questions by students. I, I'm just going to interject a question here because it tracks with what was just discussed. This discourse started, I guess, in the early 2000s, maybe late 1990s, when you had the, the Japan wave. We saw this at our university with increased enrollment of study abroad students, many of whom were coming for you know, anime and manga. How do you see the trajectory of this over time? I, I'm thinking in particular of the 2011 Toku disasters, earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis. Thereafter, there was a kind of discourse on, you know, can cool Japan survive the heat of the nuclear crisis and that disaster that that kind of nation branding, that idealization of pop culture might have been seen as superficial as compared to, you know, the more pressing concerns of the effect on the economy and the withering view of authority that came from the government's inept handling of the nuclear crisis. And, you know, there, so I wonder if, or if, are we in a different phase? Is that a way that you could, you know, Everett Rogers' notions of the diffusion of innovations, you have early adopters, innovators, early adopters, late adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. Are we at a point now where this has faded out or has it become so institutionalized now that it's actually more important and influential than it was in the initial phase? Yeah, good question, Kyle. Um, I think, I mean, the simple and short answer is that it's, it's all of these things happening at once. Um, and that's why you get a sort of conflict and confusion around what's really happening with Cool Japan. Because there are claims that Cool Japan uh, has died a number of times. Um, there are claims that it is dying and is on its way out. But then after that, you often still have Cool Japan campaigns taken up in one sector or another. So all these things are, are happening at once. And that's, that's quite easy to accept um, if you sort of follow one point of, of this book, which many anthropologists have made before, which is that the state and national ideology is not a single thing. It's a contested thing, and many offices are doing different things and often doing them at the same time. And it's that this, this often desire for us to sort of read into the state a single ideology, which causes that confusion. So the most interesting dynamic of this sort of push and pull between Cool Japan is dead, long live Cool Japan, is I think the different ways Cool Japan becomes reproduced, actually, um, and becomes reinscribed in government especially if you put a program into a government office. Government bureaucracies, government offices are very secure institutions in the sense that they have a very you know, um, fixed way of doing things, fixed way of doing business. They have their files of back programs that they've done that they can easily go back to. Um, they rely on things they've done in the past as precedent for what they will do in the future. It's easy to sort of um, maintain programs for and ideas of programs for a very long time and, until you have sort of a big shift out of them. So we saw like uh, one potential shift, again, just as you say, in 2011, with the Japan triple disaster that, okay, you know, cool Japan, popular culture in Japan is, is perhaps dead, or at least it's not the time to promote it. But then you have in 2013 was actually, if, if I'm getting my numbers right, is actually the year where the Cool Japan Fund was officially launched. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is because it takes a long time for discussions to manifest into actual policies. And so all that momentum built around Cool Japan policies and soft power then finally became inscribed in government then in 2013. And then uh, the funding was put in place for a number of years. And then the funding became sort of half privatized. So then Cool Japan as the thing which originated in the government now takes on a life of its own as it goes outside of government. It's in the hands of private organizations, which are taking on some of that funding. And then it goes out into just a public discourse in general, and then you, you have no control over it. Um, and then it's, it's going to carry on. And that's what I think explains the sort of uh, fact that cold Japan doesn't seem to, to finally die or go away. Great. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Ria Shinomi. And I have a question regarding, like, do do you think that the um the uh what do you call it the um cool Japan thing has is this still in the thing with the where 
government and old, old Japanese males are still branding the image of, of cool Japan being used only for young women, or is it more like both old Japanese governmental men and women branding the uh, young women as the image of kawaii kind of thing mm -hmm. so <clears throat> the program that i you know discussed at at most length today of the cute ambassadors this was a program very much of a particular point in time uh and then it ended you know so they were announced in february 2009 it went on for a few years um tragically one of the uh, main government advisors for this program um, actually passed away. Um, the cute ambassadors went on to sort of do their their own things. They've been very flexible, very adaptable, and it's, it's very interesting to to look at how the ambassadors themselves thought about these programs. You know, clearly these young women were were not you know simply just pawns of the government by any means. You know, they agreed to take on this role. They did so playfully. Uh, as is typical in popular culture and in cute culture. They did so playfully, they did so ironically in, in some ways. And, you know, they use that to sort of um, promote their image, to turn their image into something else and, you know, to further their, their careers. And because a, a lot of them liked it, um, particularly um, uh, the cute ambassador um, is responsible for the representing Lolita fashion. She's a full-on committed, you know, Lolita fashion advocate. She said she will um, practice Lolita fashion till she dies because for her, it's sort of like, um, she said armor for her. It's armor to protect her identity from kind of the, the outside world, which I thought was a fascinating way to describe it. Um, so it's important um, before I sort of answer your question more directly to say that uh, again, even though quite, it's quite clear that these male older Japanese bureaucrats were using the imagery of young kawaii women um, for political purposes. It's not simply that these women became pawns. Um, they too were investing in this in a playful and strategic way for their own purposes. Um, so since then, I think things have evolved quite a bit. Um, there's certainly much higher recognition and conscientiousness of of um, the gender dynamics of, uh, of Cool Japan campaigns among government officials. Um, my sense is that things are changing, although to be honest, I haven't done a lot of, of field work on this particular issue in the last um, few years. So again, this would be something I'd be very much curious in hearing about from, from some of you. Great, thank you. Um, hello, Daniel. Um, I had a question regarding just like, how Japan, specifically like government authority bureaucrats, reacted to this feeling of anxiety by uh, promoting uh, cool Japan and methods like that through, through pop culture. Um, so I noticed that um, when we had the discussion specifically about anime, there was kind of this utilization process um, for government officials specifically to kind of like promote themselves. And, and make everything seem a lot more official um, and, and kind of like represent them as a whole, um, specifically in the case that you showed us with uh, Doraemon being promoted to um, an official uh, amb um, ambassador of anime. So what I wanted to ask is, why is there a, a bit of a stark difference in the way that like, uh, bureaucrats kind of like utilize pop culture in that way compared to the uh, commodification, um, especially of like women when promoting um, certain aspects of the culture. Like it seems like these characters are being like characterized in a way that's almost, well, you know, personified, um, being promoted to like positions like ambassadorship, but um, women are kind of which they agree to, but they're kind of um, representative of something um, more general rather than just like the, the, the humanity of themselves. 
Great yeah, question. that's that's a great question. Um, and in many ways, this is precisely, I mean, the question, one of the questions that I had myself is, you know, what, what's going on with these government officials and what are they doing to popular culture? Um, and and it's precisely that sort of distinction that I try to draw out with these terms that I started with, you know, popular culture on one hand and then pop culture Japan on the other hand. Popular culture is, is very much a, a sort of rich and dynamic thing, you know, um, Doraemon is a very different thing in popular culture in anime and manga than Doraemon is as an anime ambassador, right? Uh, as you've so nicely pointed out, um, Doraemon almost seems to become like sort of dumbed down maybe, or I think the word you said was personified maybe, um, seems to be, or as, as the word um, Laura Miller said in terms of the kawaii taishi, flattened out basically. You have this sort of rich, um, diverse field of popular culture that becomes flattened out when it becomes an object of sponsorship. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but it seems that, and this is Simon Anhold's critique of white nation branding doesn't work, it seems that for the most part, when governments get their hands on popular culture, popular culture kind of loses its critical depth, its diversity. Um, why? Well, in, for one thing, I mean, bureaucrats aren't cultural creators. They have different jobs to do, basically. Um, they're not they're not hired to, so to be creative, even though many of them certainly are. Um, but in their capacity as a bureaucrat, it's not it's not their job to sort of be playful, to break rules, which is what so much about popular culture is about. Um, you know, Draymond is always doing uh, uh, unexpected things. You know. Uh, always pulling out something new from its uh, from Doraemon's toolbox, right? And so that playfulness is just not a part of government bureaucracy, um, and that's that's where you get this sort of um, a kind of weird transition and translational process where bureaucrats are trying to translate popular culture, which is clearly perceived as fun and appealing among publics abroad. And trying to turn that into a political tool and when you do that it loses so much of its playfulness and that's why it just doesn't work and why you have images of Doraemon which are very flattened out I think thank you David so we have about 10 more minutes and there is another class after this so we'll have to finish probably at 5 20 but perhaps I could read some of the questions for others. Everyone, I think the reason the chat history is not transparent to everyone else is that if it were, it would be overlaid across the top of the video recording. So I'm able to see it, but actually people who are, from what I understand, zooming in are not able to see it. Um, so, Yi Lo, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Great, thank yes. you. Hi, um, thanks for the, the fascinating talk. Uh, I, I was curious why you chose to designate um, this, this nation brand image of Japan as pop culture Japan instead of using the more commonly used term cool Japan. Are you trying to indicate that there's a, a gap between these two terms? Yeah, thank you. That's that's a great question. Yeah, so for me, I'm, I'm trying to make a, a clear distinction here. So. Uh, cool Japan is definitely like the formal activities that the government has invested in in order to brand the nation in a particular way. Um, with the term um, pop culture Japan, I'm trying to point not at those specific policies, which to me were what most studies of Cool Japan had focused on, but rather something different, which was really the sort of underlining affects and feelings of anxiety which I thought would, were portrayed quite clearly in practices of Cool Japan branding, but weren't explaining them and weren't describing where they were coming from. So I thought you needed this other term here, Pop Culture Japan, in order to help point our attention to these feelings of anxiety, which I thought were created um, in the sort of um, through the political lens that bureaucrats were seeing Japan in East Asia and through a historical lens that bureaucrats were seeing themselves and seeing the nation of Japan as declining from a certain status that they held in their memories from the 1980s of being at the top of 
the world and being at the top of the world, importantly, in Asia, from their point of view, right? Certainly contested by many people in East Asia, right? Um, but from their point of view, Japan was sort of ascendant in Asia and had fallen. And that's what was generating a lot of that anxiety. So pop culture Japan tries to point to that affective process by which that anxiety is through practices of cool Japan transcribed and translated into a kind of feeling of hope for the future of Japan. Does that make sense? Great, thank you, Dan. And thank you, Hawaii. Um, Mike, Mike Fitz, would you like to put your question to Dan? Very good. Uh, yes, uh, I was wondering if um, you had noticed that uh, the Japanese government had moved on to co-opting Oshikatsu, which is increasingly in the news, seems to be the new one overtaking uh, the ideas of pop culture in general. Any signs of that? Do you, do you have you noticed that that perhaps could be the next um, phase in cool Japan, co-opting uh, the Oshikatsu phenomena? I haven't. I haven't noticed. Can you can you say more about it? Well, Oshikatsu, you must be aware, right, that uh, there is a great deal of interest now abroad in uh, people following the, not just idols, but um, a great deal of other interests. Uh, I saw a, a figure the other day, 90% of high school students now have an Oshi. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I think I might have missed the phenomenon. Really? <laughs> well, I'll have to point you towards um, perhaps the Japan Times recently have been writing about uh, Oshikatsu. Mike, can <laughs> you define terms, please? So Oshi, um, as you know, can be translated as push, but also as a follower. So you've got people who are not as interested in idols, but um, could be train spotting, could be uh, adult video stars. But the difference is that they're actively encouraging these stars and also actively encouraged to pay for those stars, uh, for meetings, uh, for handshakes, that kind of thing. Now, the reason I mention it is because as a journalist, I got invited to a press conference yesterday online um, organized by I think it's Ministry of Foreign Affairs through one of the uh, press clubs and I got the impression that this is going to be the next big thing for them because uh, they had called the press conference all about Oshikatsu and had an expert to tell us you know what a wonderful thing they were doing to market uh, Oshikatsu mm -hmm. in Japan and around the world from now on. Uh it sounds wonderful. I'd be super excited to read your, your article on this, Mike. Very good. Right. Yeah, I have a question here. Um, with regard to other countries, I some years ago I was in Thailand and there's an area called Siam Square in Bangkok that seems like a combination of Harajuku and Shibuya. I know that the cool Japan discourse has migrated out to places like Taiwan, Singapore, other other Asian countries. So, you know, what are they selling and what are people buying? Is it a similar kind of nation branding or do you have any sense of how those variations of cool Japan, you know, in another country like cool Taiwan or whatever, um, how that is changing as it goes into another culture? And you know, in what ways this discourse is being co-opted for other governments for their use. Right. So this has been this question, I, I think, has really been some, the long-term research of Koichi Ibuchi. Um uh, you know, he, he was sort of one of the, the first main writers to talk about. Um, what he called the process of, of sort of recentering globalization, taking it out of, of the West to the East phenomenon and uh, or the West to the rest phenomenon and looking at places uh, in Japan in the 1990s, for example, that 
that started sort of engaging its own process of, of globalization, how we understand that. Um, when he was writing about it in the 1990s, you know, he noted that um, as one consequence of this was a process of this sort of, of um, pan-Asian affinity that certain people felt in Asia um, when they sort of recently had alternatives to Western media, Western Hollywood movies in order to, to consume and find some affinity and find some recognition of their lives in what is sometimes called sort of alternative modernities. Now, obviously there's a sort of a boomerang process to that in the sense that, you know, bureaucrats hear about those stories and then reproduce them themselves at home saying that yes, elsewhere in, in Asia, people are loving Japanese popular culture, people are growing up with popular Japanese culture. And even to the extent that, you know, I had bureaucrats, you know, cite to me any number of times um, that people from all over Asia, as well as in the Middle East, had all known, you know, the popular Japanese drama Oshin, had grown up with it, had understood the, the labors of Japanese modernity through that TV show, and had really seen themselves in that light too. And thus, why countries like Saudi Arabia or Iraq, for example, had looked up to Japan as a model for modernization, a story that certain bureaucrats liked to, uh, to tell themselves about themselves. Um, obviously, not exactly the story that people were, were telling themselves in, in the places these bureaucrats were talking about. So popular culture and the waves that popular culture goes through is fast and goes through many waves. So obviously after the first wave of, of cool Japan died down, um, we had arguably the far more prominent wave and to this day of, of cool Korea, right? The how do you, how do you, or how do you? Um, and, you know, in, in many ways, Korea has by far won out in terms of the battle for popular culture in, in East Asia. Um, Great, thank yeah. you, Dan. We have just barely five minutes, and I guess our last question will be by my colleague, Sachiko Horiguchi. I'd like to thank Sachiko for helping to facilitate this particular lecture. Um, we've been talking about this for some months. And uh, so, Sachiko, you have the last word. Well, I, I didn't want to take off the sort of very last bit, but uh, thanks, Dan, for the uh, excellent talk. I must confess that I haven't finished reading the book, so if it's in the book, I apologize. But I, uh, like, throughout, I, I really get the sense that, like, this whole anxiety is always, like, against the sort of nostalgic sense of how Japan used to be really good, right, and had this hard power, economic power and everything, and it's that's projected onto, like, hope, but it seems like that hope is also kind of um, what I, I would think as nostalgic in the sense that it's kind of like going back to the old times kind of thing, or like um, also delving into things that have been around for a while, like kawaii stuff, Harajuku, there's nothing really new about it. Uh, Doraemon is even older sort of, right? Uh, and it kind of like, it kind of brings up like this like good old Showa kind of feel maybe uh, and that satisfied the older folks uh, is, is how I kind of see it and that's you no know, wonder because these older folks sort of said this kind of like uh, the, um, the the policies and you know, the, the like it's their affect being projected right and I kind of wonder like well, what's the future here because the hope to me isn't real kind of hope for like something new maybe but like hope for going back to the old days kind of thing and whether like that will continue on or whether at some point Japan will kind of maybe like move into a different kind of hope. Um, yeah, and I, I kind of wonder how you kind of Thank feel you about so much, Carl. Yeah. And Dan, we're just about out of time. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, I'll just say, yeah, Sajiko, that's, that's a fantastic observation. And indeed, that's the reproductive capacity of this, that the hope is being sort of recast in the future, but along old terms of what Japan used to be, so. That's the short version, but thank you for that 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 nuanced analysis. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time. Really fascinating and informative talk. And our class will be studying this further, and uh, I'll be in touch with you separately. So everyone who joined, thank you so much for your time and patience. And we're going to sign up for now. Thank you.